Test. Well, coming. Thank you for coming. We greatly appreciate you coming tonight. We know that April is an especially busy time. Uh, it is for us. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, I presume for everybody, especially this period of time. Welcome also on behalf of B'nai Zion. I'm Rabbi Jana De Benedetti, and uh, we are very excited that that everyone is here tonight, um, especially because it gives us a small opportunity to let you appreciate our renovated sanctuary. If you've been here before, hopefully you see that it's nothing like what it was before. If nothing else, you can see and you can hear. <laughs> and that wasn't a possibility before, about a month ago. So we're glad you're here. And if you want a tour of the, f the newness of it, I'm happy to show that to you afterwards. But at this point, I would like to invite Dr. Nis Lisa Nicoletti to come up, please, and introduce our speaker. So thank you so much for being here tonight. We have the honor tonight of learning from doc, um, Dr. Barbara Gluck, who has two PhDs, one in history and one in political science, and for the last eight years has been the director of the Mauthausen Memorial near Linz in Austria. 
Uh, she is in the United States on a six month long research trip. Uh, she is a fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum who called me about two weeks ago to say, would you like, um, would you like her to come to your community and would you like her to come to your class? And this is a really exceptional experience. This is her first city visit, so I hope you'll uh, help me and my students <clears throat> in extending a very warm welcome to her to Shreveport, so it'll be a memorable part of her six month stay in the United States doing research on the testimonies of survivors of Mauthausen and the subcamps. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure for me um, being here and um, to have the opportunity to, to tell you something about the Mauthaus Memorial and about my work uh, in Austria at my memorial. Um, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's, um, it's something different for me um, speaking about Holocaust here in the States and speaking about Holocaust in Austria where it happened. It's a kind of different thing of um, how do you get connected to this uh, topic. And um, today I'm here um, and I don't want to tell you some facts and figures about the Mauthausen concentration camp. I don't want to show you pictures um, of the mass murdering or the gas camera. And now you can Google it, yeah? And uh, so that's what I, I did um, yesterday. And um, it's, um, I have to tell you, it's, it's, it's not the way how we work in our memorial. It's uh, something different. So um, today evening I'm here with two questions. And um, I don't have the answer. It's, it's up to you to build your own answer. And um, if we have time, we, um, we can reflect it and we can discuss, this, discuss it afterwards. And um, these two questions um, are based on a big pedagogical educational concept we developed at our memorial. And um, it's, it's about that um, every single visitor is the center of, what, of our ideas, of our reflections and our actions. And the part of the interaction is the key of everything we, we teach at the memorial. And it's, a, it's, it's the challenge to find the balance between yourself, the historical place, and the content. And um, to start with the first question, it is the question, how was it possible that millions of people were killed amidst the civilian society? And this question I ask every single group coming to Mauthausen, coming to the memorial. And it's, it's very difficult to, to find an answer, and I don't want an answer now. Um, maybe you could think about it and uh, could build your answer. And uh, I'm not sure if there exists a single one answer, the right answer. And uh, I'm sure for my, for my person, when I ask this question again and again, maybe I find a new answer, yeah? a new way how, how to deal with it. And uh, I would like to show you an example how we work um, at our memorial with this question. Because people come at the memorial, at the historical place, to, um, to get to know more about the topic. But it is, it is a challenge to, to talk about it on this specific uh, side. Because you can see a lot, but at the same time, you see nothing. And it's, so it's more than that, it's hard to understand. And to, to, to find a kind of answer, um, there is this sentence, every human being could be a victim, but also could become a perpetrator. And it was, so just last week that I had the opportunity to be part of a workshop at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And it was a workshop together with some Catholic bishops from Europe and Asia. And one of them mentioned this sentence in his talk. And I'm still working on it, I have to say. And uh, he underlined this sentence uh, by the following. 
if you see or hear about a problem, the most common reaction is, if it's not happening to me, I don't care. But if you are not aware of a problem, you are involved. So you let it be a problem. And um, my, my reflection about that is um, that shouldn't be an excuse for the crime or for the mass murdering. But maybe it could be an approach for better understanding. And uh, it, I'm sure I take this home with me when I'm back in Austria. And I would like to share it with my uh, visitors at the memorial, with my students, just to, to figure it out. And this, maybe it's one of many answers you, you can find out of this. And um, to, to show you something from, um, from the memorial, um, you can see this picture, and it's. Uh, we talked about it today morning uh, with um, um, students here, and um, the first answer were, "It's a nice picture." Um, you can see green lawn, trees, the sun shines, nothing negative on it. And um, what I want to explain, and what I'm doing at the, what I do at the at the memorial is it, I explain what happened on this ground 70 years ago. So, 70 years ago, there was a soccer field. Nothing negative. It's, um, Mauthausen was a community, active community, uh, a soccer team. They played e nearly every Sunday against some other, and uh, some other um, groups. And uh, at the same time, on the same place, there was one part of the main concentration camp, Mauthausen. It's called Sikh camp. It's, it was called Russian camp for the Soviet uh, prisoners of war. And it was one part of the main camp in Mauthausen where many, many, many people died. In 1942, just in 10, in 10 months, more than 5,000 people. They let them there just to die, with no help, no support, no medical care, nothing. And what I want to share with you is, I would like to show you the whole picture. And that brings me back to my main question. How could that be? How could you play on that soccer field next to the place where people died? And I have to realize I can't find an, ans an answer. Yeah? And it's, it's not a satisfaction yeah, to, um, to live with that. But the question is, did they, did they know what happened there? Could they see anything? The soccer field was part of their daily life. And the death of people next to them as well? I don't know. So we can find documents, we can find reports, we can find testimonies telling us the stories. But it's, it's the one thing to know it, and it's the other thing to understand it. And what I want to share with you is, uh, it's just the way we talk about it at, our, at my memorial and uh, what I would like to give all my visitors um, back home that they understand and that they, that they learn out from this, just from this picture, to, to ask, to ask now, to ask immediately what and why. I said I would like to ask you a second question. The second question is, and it's, till up, it's, it's, it's up to date, what does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with you? It's 70 years ago, you could say, okay, I have other problems. Um, we could talk about something else. And it's, it's one of our biggest challenges to, to build a bridge, to build a bridge from today from the present, from 2014 to the past, to 70 years ago, to 
explain what happened and to, to realize history didn't start 38 and history didn't end up 45. It's still today. And it's up to you that we could learn something or not. And when, when we discuss this question, I, I have something for you that um, we, we show in our current exhibit. This is a plaque, German written, Roma zurück nach Indien, that means Roma back to India. So with this plaque, we, we work out the genocide on the Roma, and um, I ask, uh, what is this a kind of plaque? It's a racist plaque, and um, what could it be? What is the background of this story? And, uh, and then I ask the question, what do you think, how old is this plaque? From which time? And I discussed it recently, some weeks ago at the Holocaust Museum, and I got the answer, oh, that could be from the 1930s. But this is from 1995. <laughs> Happened in Austria, and it was a hidden bomb being designed Roma back to India. And what, what would I like to tell you? I would like to say that Hostility against any group in a, in a society didn't end 45. And this is just one example out of many, many other recently in, in Europe. Yeah? When you look to Hungary, to France, it's, it, was not, it was not over 45, and it, was, it wasn't Hitler himself. So it's, it's and it's not, it's not a, <laughs> a nice thing to, to talk about. It's, it's happened today, yeah? and even even in Austria and in Europe. And um, so the question could be, why I'm talking about it? Yeah, I should talk about Nordhausen and not about something happened um, 1995. Uh, um, we show this plaque in our new exhibit Ec to do exactly what I'm what I talked about to to build a bridge. To, to show how history continued. Yeah? But why? Why do we show this plaque in our exhibit? This plaque tells a story. Maybe it tells more stories. One story is about Michael Horvath, who was born in 1922 in Austria, in the south of Austria, uh, in a Romani family. And he was deported to Dachau, Buchenwald, and Mauthausen, and Gusen is a, is a sub-camp of Mauthausen, next to Mauthausen, and he was liberated there. And um, 2000 and 2001, we had a large interview project with more than 1,000 survivors, and he was one of them. And in this interview, he, he tells us the following. In summer 1945, I arrived home from the concentration camp. I had been traveling for one month, at home, I didn't recognize any of the houses, nothing. They were destroyed. There were 360 gypsies in my village, and 19 came back. Hitler marked us out like the farmer he stable in the morning. 1995, when there was the bomb attack that killed four people, two of them were my grandsons, Kali and Irvin. My friend kept coming to see what, ha what had happened, then Mishka, how did it happen? I hear that your two grandsons were there. I said, yes. And how and when and where? Did you hear anything? No, we didn't hear anything. So this is, for me, a, a very special story to tell at my memorial to show how history continues. And to show how crime continues. And this is out from the, from the internet, um, a picture from this after the bomb attack in, in, in Austria in 1995. To, to talk about a story like Michael Horvath and, um, and the background, 
it's it's like a puzzle. You have to put things together, many, many different kind of sources, documents, um, testimonies, and um, pictures um, from different kind of archives all over the world. And this is how we how we tell the stories at our memorial. It's uh, it's more than just um, a single date and more than just a name or a number. It's the story behind it. And that's what I want to tell you, that it's what you can bring home, you can take home, yeah? and you can think of it. And you will, maybe you will remember some years ago the story of Michael Howard. And um, Michael Howard is one of many, many life stories uh, we tell in our new exhibit. We recently opened last year, and um, in in our tours through the memorial. So, I would like to share some impressions um, from the memorial today, how it looks like, and um, um, about our new exhibits. So this is the memorial today, and you can maybe you can. I can. This is the ground I talked about with the soccer field. So this is the place with the soccer field, and this is the place with the former sick camp. So now you can imagine, this is one soccer field, how big the whole area is. And this is one of some things we have to, we have to deal with this. It's a very large area, and it's, it's hard to go through on one single day. So it's, it's important to to find some specific places, some specific topics with some stories to talk about. To talk about how it looked like and how it was. So you can see the difference. It's still big today, but it was in a dim dimension bigger than you can't, you can't understand. And what we did the last years is we, we created a new concept. Um, we were thinking, what is a memorial today? What is our responsibility? What, how should we talk about Holocaust? And uh, it, it took us some years to find answers. And as I, as I told you, it's, it's a thing with question and answers. Um, it's maybe the, the, our answer today, and uh, the next generation find another answer. So we created two new exhibits, one about um, the mass murdering. And as you can see, we work, um, as I showed you the picture of the green lawn, we work with um, pictures from today and explain on the back side what happened 70 years ago. What evidence, what proof can we find today about the mass murdering 70 years ago? And what can we learn out of this? This is, it's like, it's, it's difficult to, to, you cannot experience anything what happened, but you can, you can see what you, what you find today, yeah? which document you have today. Um, don't want to talk about Holocaust denial happened in Austria many, many times. It's sometimes you need an, an evidence, and sometimes you have to work it out like like this. And we have documents, we have original items, and we have the historical place. And the the second exhibition gives an overview of the history of the concentration camp. On one, on one hand, on the other hand, tells you stories out of the daily life of the concentration camp for a better understanding. It's, um, it's, it should give an, a kind of frame what happened in Europe, what happened um, about the Second World War, about Hitler raised up in, in Germany, 33. So it's, it's more than 38 to 45, and it's more about Mauthausen. Mauthausen was not only one single concentration camp, Mauthausen was a system of more than 40 concentration camps all over Austria. And the system Mauthausen was a part of a whole concentration system 
in the Third Reich. And that is really complex to, to talk about. And, and again, you have to put some specific points out of this huge frame and out of this big system just to explain it with a single story. I talked a lot about our responsibility being a museum and teaching about Holocaust. But this place is also a memorial. There still is a cemetery and many, many people come every year to commemorate. And we have specific places where you can do this. This is just for one example. Um, I took this picture because today morning we talked about it, um, how you could um, commemorate yeah, at this place. And this is a very special place for me because it's an individual, it's a place where you can commemorate for your relative, for your grandfather, for your uncle. And you, you can put there a picture, a photo, just uh, the last sentence you would give. And um, there are no rules. You can come today and pick up the picture of your, of your uh, relative, just to, just to commemorate. And this is, uh, this is a room in the former infirmary, prisoner infirmary, and it's um, what you can see on the, on the left side. This, is, this was the crematorium. So this is a very special room for every survivor coming to this room and to, to commemorate. And what we, what we did last year, what we opened last year, we, we created a new um, memorial room, a room of names. It took us more than eight years for a huge research project to, to find and to collect every single name of a Mauthausen prisoner. When we started eight years ago, we had 30,000 names, and it was clear it is more than that. And in this room, you can find more than 80,000 names of Mauthausen prisoners, of Mauthausen victims. And you can, it's not, it's not in any order, it's not alphabetical, it's not uh, after some victim groups, it's, it's just to see, to get an impression how many and to commemorate. And then you can, you can see it, you can see it here. You can look after a single name, um, you get the place and the date of birth and the nationality and the, and the date of, of death. Oh, sorry. What I would like to share with you before I conclude is what is the Mauthausen Memorial in our opinion? So it's not a kind of sanatorium for a better behavior. It's not a scary museum or a place of voyeurism. And it's more than just a history lesson. In my point of view, it's a place of reflection. It's a documentation based on facts. It's a place for remembrance and dignity. And hopefully an approach for raising awareness. I would like to conclude to, to share some personal reflections I have. As you heard, um, for six months, I'm here in the, in the States um, because I have a fellowship at the Great Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I'm here together with my husband and my little son, who is three and a half. And some, some weeks ago, um, we all celebrated um, a wonderful and, and very touching birthday party for our close friend, Marty. And Marty is 85, and Marty is a Holocaust survivor. Marty was in Mauthausen and was liberated there. And, uh, and Marty has a horrible, but at the same time wonderful life story to tell. But, but the only fact, what I'm really reflective or worried about is, is the thing that when my little son Oscar 
is old enough to ask questions or to ask his questions, Marty won't be here to answer. It's me and it's you. That is our challenge to keep it alive the right way. Thank you. I would, I would like to invite you to, to share some reflections, to ask me some questions, what do you, what do you think, what, do you, what you would like to ask me, or maybe you found an answer of what I asked you before, the two main questions. So the, the floor is yours, it's, it's ours to discuss, please. Me personally, it's, um, it's a good question. And after more than eight years, I, I, you heard I studied history and I always was deep in history and I, I, I always try to understand. And I have to realize I cannot understand. It's, it's a kind of motivation, a personal motivation to, to talk about, to teach, to teach about Holocaust. It's, it's, I think that the feeling um, is, is much more bigger since I have my little son, because I don't know what I'm gonna tell him. And it's, the thing is, the thing is with the questions and the answer. And sometimes I think, I got it, I have the answer. And the next day, you have another question, or you have the same question again, and you have to go back to the beginning to ask you again, and it's... I always, I always wanted to know why, why things happen. And it's, it's when you're a historian, it's, it's, it's very interesting, you, you go deeper and deeper in the past, and you, you ask why did things happen, and you're in in the in the forties, and you talk about the Second World War, and then you ask why, and then you you s you're in thirty eight annexion of Austria, so talking about my home um, country and, and and history, but then you have to go back. What about antisemitism in Europe? Yeah, it existed longer. Yeah, you have to go to the former century, to the nineteenth century, and then you can find a really deep antisemitism all over Europe. But then you have to go further and say, okay, why? So, and again and again. Yeah? And this is, this is, for me, on the one hand inter interesting, and on the other hand very difficult to explain and um, to, to talk about and to teach it. And this is always um, maybe a personal challenge. I'm not sure if you, you, <laughs> you get the right answer as you expected. I don't, I don't know, but it's uh, just my my personal um, discussion between answering and questioning. What are some of the questions or answers that young people give you when they come to visit the concentration camp? Remorse. Yeah. Um, that's, that's different because every visitor is, is, is different. It, it depends on their background. And sometimes they come and they have the, the they come and they want they want to see the gas chamber. And they say, okay, I'm here because I know people died here and they died at the gas chamber and was, they want to see the gas chamber. And then I go with them to all other places, to this beautiful lawn, yeah, to this beautiful ground, to some other places, to the quarry, um, to a places where you can't see anything. And then I explain what happened 70 years ago and how people died there. And after that, they don't want to go to the gas chamber because they realized it wasn't only the gas chamber. It was a daily life. It was to work with the hard conditions, the, um, 
the um, bad circumstances, the, um, the, the treatment by the SS, the punishment, uh, many, many, many other actions. When you, when you come to Mauthausen, one of the other questions is, how could that be? And that's the same question I ask them. They come and they see houses on the opposite hill. And they ask me, oh, there is a farm. Did the farm exist 70 years ago? And I say, yes. And they ask, but I'm sure they have seen something. What did they say? And there are some stories. Yeah, I, did would, I could tell you the stories <laughs> till the next morning. Um, there we have some evidence that people saw something. And the discussion is um, when we talk, when I talk with Austrian students, is is about being a perpetrator, being a collaborator, bystander. What what is a bystander? You see something, and you say, "Hey, it's not my problem," so I don't have any problem. I'm a bystander, or not? And when am I a bystander? Am I a perpetrator? So this is, for Austria, this is a very, very serious discussion and very serious question because for many years, Austria was sure Austria is the first victim. And it was in the late 80s, there's perpetrators. And this, you have to go to what happened. So that is one of the questions they did they see anything? And uh, um, this is a very personal. Like family members who were like in the Holocaust. We are not sure. The, um, maybe we have someone, but this is one fact. Um, I didn't tell you about finding every single name. Is um, that we have to recognize? It's not possible to find every single name. Maybe you heard of one of the death marches going from one camp to another camp, um, being gassed in, in, in a big number of, 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 of prisoners in, in Auschwitz or somewhere else. So we think um, there is an uncle from my mom, but we are not sure. We have no proof. With European history, and uh, do you run into some resistance when, when it has to be brought up through memorial that that was a very deep and ugly time for many people in Europe, Germany, Austria? Is, do you find resistance in that sometimes because they don't really like to look back at the dark past? Um, it was for, I think it's, it's, I'm the third generation and I think it's, um, the, they don't want it, they didn't want to talk about it, yeah, you, you, you're right. And she said nothing. Yeah. Um, we didn't talk about it. They don't want to talk about it. And uh, every day at the memorial or in our archive, it is more and more and bigger and bigger. And it's the third and the fourth generation. More about grandfathers from their family. Oh my, that my relatives just to be, to get to, to get an evidence from the, in their own family. And that's I think um, to do research f um, in your own. Okay, you said that there were 80,000 prisoners. No, I said uh, 80,000 uh, Names victims. that you found. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how many of those survived no, that, that you're are, aware of? That is the number of people died. That's the number of people yeah. that died, not yeah. just, okay. More than 200,000 um, people were imprisoned. Okay. So half of them, nearly half of them died. Okay, now... The picture you showed of the tables, and those are names that are engraved on yeah. the flat surface of the table. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just trying yeah. to get a m yeah. more visual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the prisoners of this, so today. Um, my first friends didn't have dads because they fought in the war. As a young physician, when I had, and we learned that you experiences. Mm -hmm was living in Germany in the early 70s in the mill opener as well. But it, 
And then, as, and when they became teenagers, each one of them, me, and we went back and um, at theirs. Uh, it was interesting to see attitudes and their lives and their experiences changed. And then to watch now, as these kids are not 16, but 40 and 45, how these experiences that they got going to Dachau and seeing the, the memorial and seeing the places has really altered their lives and how they look at so many things, not just the Holocaust, but many other things as well. And how it opened their mind and it uh, opened their uh, consideration for so many other things. Besides, what I think part of our people need to visit to on, on all of this, not just the context of it, because it's going on today in all over the world. It's going on in many disputes, many difficult so going on in civilized countries and ever and as the as the the sign forget today morning uh, when i talked to students 70 years ago and uh, that was a perfect answer yet you said something yourself just now and have clarity because then it's anymore it's history six mm -hmm. and six there's always ambiguity and uh, you know, my, I'm Jewish. My mother loved Roosevelt growing up, and all the Jews voted for Roosevelt. And yet he and his administration denied entry to Jews to this country. And there was a conference, and they tried to come up with a solution. They didn't, and they denied entry. And uh, at least England allowed children, kinder transport. The United States didn't do anything. And, uh, and yet at the time, you know, there, well, there's different political considerations, and and there are reasons, and do we want immigrants, and you know, and even now, currently in Israel, you know, is it well? There are reasons why maybe Jews shouldn't be able to live someplace because they're Jewish, you know, even if it's Judea, you know. I mean, and well, there are political reasons, and you know, and maybe it's bad, you know, and it's that's the problem is that when it's current. There are ambiguities, there are two sides. If, if Hitler were alive now, he'd, he'd have a smile and people might like him. You know, that's the problem. It's easy question. It's, uh, you, you're right. Asking yourself, how could you, it's, it, starts, it starts to be a problem. Do you find that, that I'm, I'm a teacher, <laughs> that's why there's making between the experience of um, the prison, other groups that might be at Europe. Um, you mean from? It's you, you. You can't compare. It's more than that. It's it's a kind of question, and they. How could I motivate them to reflect what they are doing, what they see? What do they do that? Um, do you find them? I don't know it when when they when they go back home. I, I just what I know is the um, the reflections we have after our tour and and in our mm -hmm. discussion, and um, they are they are really open and really reflected to what they saw and um, because you know we we talk about being. You talk, we talk about the, um, the um, for example, the classification they made. Yeah, this is um, a Jewish victim, a Roma victim, a homosexual victim. So this kind of classification. Yeah, and it's um, yeah. What kind of different uh, we have in Austria? Different kind of rule or not? It's uh, a, very, uh, a very personal moment. I'm not sure if I'm interested in getting to know that. Yeah, but I wish. Mm -hmm. I just say, related to the third Poland, first of all, he was part of the night and tried to turn himself prisoner several times when in Italy, where he defected. Talked about his experience mainly, I learned that from my mother, who was from Belgium for three years, and um, I teach German, among other things. Met several German people who that movie. I was telling my German friends how it, these people were in there at that time, probably in there. 
60s or 70s, then it became very upset. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to hear about it, they didn't want to go see it. And I'm realizing that for me, it's way easier to go back into the problem and dig into it. For them, it was just very sensitive. And I, I, I felt I, I had hurt them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, do you find that people from the other, the older generations, they either don't want to talk about it or they're upset about it or they think it's just not good stirring, you know, the past? What, the, what I experienced is that um, many people think they, when they come from Austria or from Germany, they have to feel guilty. And so they don't want to talk about it. They are afraid um, getting more information about it because they, they, they think they become more and more guilty what happened before. But to feel guilty when you don't talk, to, uh, when you don't care. So that's... The, totally feel guilty what happened, yeah? But... I know in your years of studying history, um, I'm familiar with the German people in Germany not wanting studies of the history. Has anything been brought out about, have you, of Hitler in his past that created some of the thinking of his thinking? I think that was that his mother supposedly work for the Jews. I don't know uh, his life experiences. It's a, a thing I, I don't know, yeah. Um, I, I should look after it, but um, so Hitler, yeah, grew up in a small typical Austrian village. Yeah? So Hitler is originally from Austria, yeah, so that's, um, it's, uh, but it doesn't matter, yeah, but it's, uh, he grew up in a small village in, in, in Upper, no, sorry. In, in, in no, yes, in, in in Upper Austria, in Braunau, and um, he studied um, art in uh, in Vienna, and uh, he grew up uh, with a very high anti-Semitic, um, um, yeah, um, city in Vienna. It was um, it was common to yeah to talk about anti-Semitism and to to defend his thesis and and, and so, and. Um, I'm not sure how old he was when he left uh, Austria and, and went to Germany, but um, the thing is, it's, and it doesn't matter if it's brown or, yeah? and, it's an, and then when I studied history, was the, he lived in a city where I live, so, yeah, um, in, in, in Vienna, yeah, what, what was this kind of, um, in that time, the yeah, during his studies, yeah, um, born, I, I, I'm born in Vienna, yeah, I was born in Vienna, yeah, so how could he get this kind of ideas, yeah, and uh, you can study his, uh, his personal um, life and, and, and his, it's, um, it's a kind of, it's a kind of um, reflection how the time was. It was the economic crisis, it was um, after the First World War, um, it wasn't a really um, a great time for Europe um, to, to grow up, and so it was the exact the, the, the time where Hitler um, was born and, 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 and grew up in, in, in Austria. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a good question, really. Here's one more question. Um, are many people who come to you as students aware already of the Holocaust and of anti-Semitism? Not knowledge aware when they come in. Um, most of the students, um, they come to Mauthausen, they, um, they, um, and get to know some, you can see the movies, you can, um, but I don't know if Oriel is aware. I don't know. Um, it's, um, I can, when they get back home, when they went back, I don't know. 
100,000 visitors uh, every year. Um, other half, 100,000 are international. And um, we have, uh, most of our international visitors come from Italy. They have a special kind of um, tradition how to commemorate. And um, we, get, we get more and more visitors from Eastern Europe countries. The biggest um, victim nation is Poland. Then you have Hungary. And um, another victim group is um, the Soviet prisoners of war. So you have people coming from these countries um, to see the memorial. Our family has a rather personal connection to Mauthausen. My husband uh, is of Austrian descent. His, his um, mother was um, in Linz, mm -hmm. and uh, during the war, she, she was born in 1929, and uh, at some point, teenager, she was wanting to listen to the radio, and apparently, I don't know, time when it was forbidden, and a neighbor turned her in at about 15. Mm -hmm. And um, what what might detail about everything, but basically she worked mm -hmm. doing office work of some sort. The end of the war, we have a blanket that she took with her, and she was found wondering, would there be any records that we would have access to any kind of uh, data? I'm very much interested in getting more about this story and more details. Um, yes, we have a database and uh, we had uh, an, a big archive and uh, many possibilities to look um, to look after yeah the name uh, and uh, maybe we find something yeah. Can we say thank you very much? We appreciate this. Thank you very, very much. That was very, very powerful, and we really appreciate that. I, I think that if nothing else, I imagine when you see the soccer field and the, and the camp right in the middle of it, even if they came with no other information before, I would imagine now any kid who goes out to play, if they come in and they hear a story like this, they look around and they wonder what's happening on the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. And they always wonder from then on. And you pray that this can never happen again because they're always wondering what happens on the other side of mm -hmm. the fence. Mm -hmm. So we don't get to be bystanders or perpetrators or victims anymore. That was wonderful. We really appreciate that. And one more, thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to make sure that you're all aware that Every year, this will be our 31st year that we will have a Holocaust memorial service in the community. This year, it's April 27th at 4 o'clock. You'll see information everywhere. You can come to the B'nai Zion website and, and other places, and um, the newspaper will have information, but I um, missed before. But this year, the essay contest is specifically about a young man who wrote a hypothetical poem about his hypothetical child. And he said, his called, and he said, when he told us that was the name of his, when he's nine or 10 and he asked me questions, I pray that he denies it. I pray you need to see it before yeah. your child turns nine or 10 okay. because it's a very powerful thing. And that's exactly our prompt. Every year we have an essay question for the high school, the world around them. We greatly appreciate that you came and the other, the questions, the answers, the presentation. So you, if you go to the B'nai Zion web as well, in case you want to see it again. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. What a, what a job you have. <laughs> what an impossible task. Yeah. <laughs> I try to be a spiritual leader. I think that's hard, but uh, this is even... Uh, I, I'm